So first, Kevin O'Neill from the Rockefeller Foundation, long-term friend, collaborator, partner. Uh, next to him, I see Vajanti's um, sort of video block and Vajanti from the World Bank leads ID4D <clears throat> and the G2PX on government to people transfers uh, the work uh, as a, both trust funds at the World Bank. Uh, again, a long-term collaborator. Uh, Kezom, Kezom, uh, many of us know uh, people on the call. She is with UNDP and uh, leads a lot of the work on the digital development uh, around the world and uh, has been a great champion of digital public infrastructure. Kanwaljit Singh uh, from the Gates Foundation, uh, calling in early from Seattle. Thank you, Kanwal, uh, for joining early. Um, I don't know if Satish is on the line i see he's dialed in but um hopefully when he comes satish is joint secretary of internal affairs and um uh, leads a lot of the in international work that the ministry of external affairs of government of india has with countries and they're focused very much on dpi so we'll get satish when when we can see him um but i just have um you know the one one thing that we've all seen over the last I'd say a few years, uh, we've had many countries come to India uh, you know, and look at Aadhaar and look at UPI, look at the DBT work and say, hey, how can we have this, right? And uh, we've, we've all seen this um, happen over the years. They, they go to Delhi, go to Bombay, go, come to Bangalore, spend time. They say, wow, this is great. Um, and, and so then they want to say, the next question is, how do we get it for ourselves? And... Um, that has been going on for several years now, and we've all seen this in different ways, um, especially in the last year with the G20 process uh, underway, many more countries have become exposed to the idea of DPI. And many more uh, countries uh, have seen the power of DPI in operation through their visits to India and so on. So um, what this has all done, at least as we as I see it uh, from our, my vantage point, is um, that uh, you know we have we have uh, much more interest from countries to you know certainly learn from India but also share their own experiences. We have other countries that have done very interesting work, Brazil, Estonia, and so on. So there's a lot more interest on DPI. Um, this particular group that we have here has uh, international exposure and awareness of what are the kinds of things countries are looking for when they think about DPI, right? So. Uh, this is just a, a, a question for all panelists, and I'll, I'll call out names one after the other. Um, but what are what are you seeing uh, from um, you know countries that you're interacting with, and 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 what what are they looking for uh, when they when they learn about DPI? So that's the broad question uh, which um, I will place before each of the panelists. Uh, Vajanti, I'll start with you, and uh, and then move to Kezom. Kanbal and then Kevin. And if Satish joins, uh, we'll be able to have him answer as well. Uh, Vajanti, with, with you first, please. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madhakar. And thanks uh, for the organizers uh, for this invitation. Uh, so as you said, you know, the concept of DPI has actually been around for a while, and we've all been working on this agenda. Uh, and what we saw uh, is prior to COVID, the the real impetus, I think, was a number of different things. So, you know, one is around the efficiency. So uh, improved targeting, faster, better payments. That was one, one angle. I think the inclusion uh, angle, so being able to do services remotely or from um, areas, geographic areas or across uh, economic and different social uh, barriers. The third is around resilience, whether it's climate change or pandemic response. And, and then the fourth is around innovation. So the desire for countries to see new markets and so to put the rails, as uh, as many have said, uh, put the rails for new innovation to, to materialize. So those were a lot of the impetus prior to COVID. And we saw countries like Philippines moving in that path um, with the desire for financial inclusion and broader digital transformation um, or Nigeria, Morocco um, had the impetus around better targeting for their social protection programs. So those were all in place and, um, and so the work underway. But I think what COVID did was really accelerate the, that desire in many countries who um, had some of these DPIs in place were it better able to um, reach the, their poorest. And um, some of the research that we've done uh, across 85 countries shows that 
um, those countries that had some of the DPI in place were able to have higher coverage than than those. And um, and so during COVID, many countries then saw whether it was you know uh, in Philippines or Togo or others they had to essentially pull together um, systems uh, in a way so that uh, people could be uh, targeted very quickly. And and so now we've seen a whole momentum of countries um, really take interest in, in this agenda. I think a lot because of that, uh, because of digital payments, because of the in, a desire for, for inclusion and, and targeting. So um, so I think for us, the this agenda is not one where a country will say, come to us, okay, we want to work on DPI for the sake of DPI, but it's really one of these clear drivers, these use cases around whether it's financial inclusion, whether it's delivery of social protection, uh, delivery of health systems, and now increasingly also just pandemic response and being prepared for uh, a number of other um, uh, crises. So I'm going to stop there. I'm sure others have, yeah. uh, um, and I can, I can elaborate a bit more. Thank you, Vajanti. Just one more prompt uh, for all the participants. Uh, the question and answer window is open. In case there's any question or ideas or anything that you want to suggest, please uh, uh, type, type up the question there and we'll have time for answering these questions. Um, Kezo? Uh, good evening, uh, Vajanti. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here among so many colleagues and friends. And I've already seen some very familiar names in the attendees uh, as well. Um, I do want to start out by saying that many of you are aware of the groundbreaking consensus that was achieved on digital public infrastructure under the India G20 presidency. And for UNDP, as well as my colleague Vision, they will also agree it was really remarkable India's leadership and commitment in working together with the 20 group of countries plus guest countries to recognize, acknowledge digital public infrastructure, the, uh, the importance of governance, um, and so on. So I do want to extend a heartiest congratulations to everyone who is collectively in this ecosystem and across the world who worked on, on bringing digital public infrastructure to this level of understanding. Uh, in particular, I'd like to uh, you know, call out um, a huge congratulations to the co-chair of the Digital Economy Working Group, Mr. Sushil Pai, uh, as well as thank our UN Tech Envoy, Mr. Amandeep Singh Gill, for joining the ministerial and really lending uh, UN's voice from where the Secretary General started last August of how the agenda of the India 20 presidency is really uh, linked to the upcoming UN General Assembly, the STG Summit, and to help accelerate progress towards our shared common goals, the sustainable development goals. Um, Madhuva, Madhuva, coming back to your question, I think, um, you know, digital journeys in countries are a collective effort, and, and I'm not going to be the first person to ob observe that the speed and the depth in which digital innovation is happening across many fields is uh, is something that I think many of our organizations are not uh, apt at handling and certainly we are also learning and growing and therefore you'll also see the Secretary General calling for you in 2.0 and so on. Um, and uh, if we take a country-centric lens, we know that there are many different government departments, different local contexts from cities to local communities, uh, and many different and diverse problems to solve. So when we talk about, you know, how are countries thinking about their digital journeys, I can safely say, you know, having worked across the 130 countries in which we do digital development programming, it's a messy collection of goals, messy collection of solutions and systems. And this is why we at the UN and certainly, you know, many of our member states, along with our partners at the World Bank, Rockefeller, the Digital Public Goods Alliance, and so on, we are excited about digital public infrastructure because that is where the advantage comes in. Um, it can shift the mindset, it can shift administrative policies and strategies, and uh, really create a wider set of shared infrastructure services and resource flows. And, and I think, you know, if, if I remember correctly, um, 
uh, you know, many people when internet was introduced uh, thought of internet as one of the new channel, but in reality, it was all channels. And this is how at least I see digital public infrastructure, uh, that it is uh, these sort of, you know, rails or infrastructure around which we can really achieve the sustainable development goals and solve the real and uh, challenges that many countries, many people in these countries face. Um, I mean, from, uh, I, I, maybe I'll stop here, but where and, and allow uh, our other panelists to share some perspective. Thank you, Kezom. Uh, well said. Uh, <laughs> There's just a, a lot of collection of digital artifacts around the world. And, and, and if there's a different way we can think about it, we can make it a lot more efficient, quicker, faster, better. Um, and so that's that's great. Um, could I move to then Kanwal um, and have him respond to the same question? And then we, then we go to Kevin. All right. Uh, thank you, Madhupar, for inviting me. And I think I already got my money's worth by waking up early, listening to Nandan and Pramod. So thank you to the organizers for making this possible. Uh, I wanted to peel off a layer of abstraction because when we talk about the DPI conversation, there is a tendency to talk uh, at a very high level of the impacts of DPI. But you asked, what do countries see when they come to India? They see DPI in action. So I wanted to take it one step lower than the abstract level. And basically what we have when um, countries visit India it's senior policymakers who are very well aware of all the challenges that they face in their own environments. Now, they come there, they go to a food distribution shop and look at a verified way of distributing food. And immediately an idea goes off, oh my God, this is so good if I could place this in my country. Um, when they look at a postal worker, who is able to update your Aadhaar, or who is able to cash in, cash out, uh, basically a walking human ATM who has revolutionized last mile reach. Uh, we have taken uh, countries to these centers where basically in just one room with one plastic chair with one worker, there's like hundreds of accounts being opened per hour. Um, and these examples, like when you get a, your mobile SIM in under three minutes, uh, when it, they look at biometric attendance where uh, officials are for, uh, like, you know, incentivized to come on time uh, uh, with such use cases, uh, the geo phenomenon, I don't know, 200, 300 million subscribers in a few months. So there's a lot of such aha moments, which bring the power of the DPI thinking to the fore. And then in those individual collective mindsets of those senior policymakers, uh, the question arises, why not me? Why not us? What will it take for us to get there? And I think that is the real power. Because when we talk about DPIs, I, I want to put, uh, put it as simply as I possibly can, that the world has learned to count by twos, going from two to four to six to eight and so on. So in such a world, when somebody observes that, hold on, if I just took that two and, two and raise it to the power of an exponent, I can go from two to four, four to 16, 16 to I don't know, 256. And, and that's a powerful idea. And this is the network effects that Pramod was talking about. This is so profound that you your visibility is limited to the power of this idea. And that's what countries see. And, and I think there is also skepticism. So let's be uh, uh, very clear about that. Some people will say, well, this will only work at the scale of India because it's over a billion people under one law. Africa is over a billion people under 50 plus laws, right? But there is we kind of uh, downplay the role of adaptability. So if I were to look at the case of MOSIP and how it was inspired by Aadhaar, yes, Aadhaar was built for India it was built for scale in the Indian context, but then all the learning from Aadhaar could be adapted into a modular configurable form, uh, which emerged as MOSIP. And now nine out of 11 adopting countries of MOSIP are in Africa. So I think uh, there are ways to uh, address uh, new thinking of applying DP DPI in different contexts. And I think this is where the big power play potential is. Thank you, Kanwal. Um, you're right that, uh, you know, the complexity uh, of of navigating all of this 
each country is quite daunting and and uh, of course there's no one size fits all and the question of how do you then adapt all of these to respective contexts in different parts of the world uh, a very important uh, important point uh, kevin from your vantage point how do you see this uh, thanks, Madhukar. Um, So if we roll back five or 10 years, countries wanted DPI because of the experience of Estonia or India. And it was easy to have those experiences feel irrelevant. They're too small. They're too big. Um, it's not for us. Now countries want DPI because of the experience of their own country or their neighbors during COVID. Uh, we know that countries that had basic functional layers, payments, ID, et cetera, were able to get money out to around 50% of their population on average and to do it in, in, in days or weeks, whereas countries that didn't were around 20% and were doing it in weeks or months. Um, and that includes my own country, the United States. Um, the other thing that's changed is, well, as five or 10 years ago, there weren't these support structures in place that were helping create pathways um, like co-develop, like the World Bank, like the UNDP, uh, like XDEP. Um, those are in place. And countries have seen that there's no one path to DPI and there's no one configuration that works for everybody. There's that adaptation that Conwell was talking about. Um, but what happens if we fast forward another five or 10 years? Um, and that's where those applications that Nandan was talking about to climate, to AI, et cetera, become really um, inspiring. And we begin to see the opportunity and the need. Um, and we're seeing that already. So in climate, for example, those same two, two layers that worked in health for COVID, data, payments, added if you add in weather data you begin to uh unlock new possibilities um the association of women's cooperatives sewa in india for example is testing an insurance product that pays women to stay at home and not go to factory jobs on days with their risk of heat related uh, illnesses um in bangladesh um at, with un partners um, they've developed anticipatory payments so you can send people money ahead of a natural disaster so they can prepare and be ready rather than afterwards when they're recovering. In each case, um, the prospect of onboarding people, of administering this would have been basically impossible um, without those rails of payment, ID, uh, weather data, et cetera. Um, now it's a matter of just working out the actual product. And Bangladesh has these rails, India has these rails, other places have these rails. You can have these solutions go to one place to another with fairly minimal effort, and we can scale things much more quickly. That's why countries want DPI. Well said, um, Kevin. And you know, the acceleration caused because of COVID is you know visible across the across the world. Um, there are some interesting questions coming up in the in the Q and A. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, I think the I think the idea of DPI we, we've come up with this phrase DPI to encompass a whole sort of you know way of thinking about this uh, of, about building technology. And when I look at our uh, collective uh, learning from the brick and mortar economy, um, you know we have roads that are used by the private sector and the government. We have roads that are used by the education department and the, the um, health department and every other department. Um, and so the idea of having an asset that is used by multiple agencies, both in the government and the private sector, is not new. Similarly, electricity, similarly, telephony, and so on, right? In, in digital, for very many legacy reasons, we don't see these common usable sort of assets. And all, I mean, in a very simplistic way, I believe DPI is saying is, think about the world and common reusable assets. <clears throat> don't build a road for the health department separately from the education department, separately for the private sector and so on and so forth. And so it's not really quite um, a, a radical new way of thinking, uh, if you take the example of the brick and mortar economy that we're all used to, somehow in digital, we've not been able to replicate the same thinking. Um, I might just prompt any of our speakers here to see if you might have 
a perspective to offer here. But also, if you want to pick up on one of the questions or some of the questions in the chat, um, those are fantastic questions. It'd be great to get your responses. I don't have a particular order, but um, please, please uh, chime in as you as you see fit. So Madhukar, your question reminded me of an old adage, which basically said, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree and a monkey by its ability to swim, uh, you'll be wrong twice. Um, I think the, the big leap that we make from physical to digital, it's a fundamental reshaping of the environment. So even though the idea, we kind of understand that a road is going to be used by everyone, and it's not a good idea to build individual roads for everyone. When we went to digital, I think if we take a look at the history, digital came with new properties. You cannot uh, copy a road, but in digital, copying is easy. Um, so the whole market forces that shape digital operated in a, in a somewhat new environment. Uh, the monetization of digital technologies uh, relied on on these silos. The better silo that you can build, the fancier silo that you can build, uh, the more money one would end up making. And we have seen that concentration of wealth and by extension power in um, companies which are which are now valued at over a trillion dollars. Um, so I think that's where some of the disconnect happened. And DPI thinking is now sort of grounding us back to that. Um, similar to the early days of the internet, when the purpose, uh, not only the internet, but if you look at the GPS also, the purpose may have been something else. Uh, and the creators of these technologies may not even have imagined that one day we are going to have Uber or uh, Uber Eats or that sort of stuff. But uh, this thinking of minimalistic design was ingrained. Then I think uh, the economic incentives kind of got in the way, technological development outpaced ability of uh, societal organizations to deal with it. And hence we ended up in a situation where we were in a non-DPI mode for a long time. And I think over the years now we are starting to see, oh, this, is a, this was a great idea. Why did we not do this in the first place? And which is why we are seeing so much momentum in the DPI space now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. Um, you know, there are lots of interesting questions coming up in the chat. So please go ahead. Yes. Well, I, I think it's also easy. DPI, when it works really well, it becomes invisible and becomes almost forgotten very qu quickly. Um, so, you know, you know, in my own country, um, a, a lot of us encounter DPI and think this is a strange Indian concept. I can't wrap my head around it. But the internet and GPS are some of the first DPIs, and they were started by the U.S. government. Um, they just had no concept that they were DPI when they were begun. Um, and similarly, the impacts are can be very subtle and unanticipated. Like if you were to say that DPI helped make the Indian mobile telephone and data network um, market vastly more comp competitive, that is absolutely true. But people are not naturally thinking that changes to ID or payments are making a completely separate market more competitive. So there's a lot of storytelling to be uh, told here. Um, and it's important that people see the use cases and experience them. Madhika, I'm happy to come in on the question. I, you know, I saw your question related to how can DPI help with the uh, delivery of uh, social assistance or uh, other improved services. And I, uh, obviously, people are aware of the India experience with DBT. So I'm going to um, talk about uh, the Thailand experience, uh, which, you know, the coverage of ID in Thailand is about 99%, uh, also including refugees and migrant workers. And um, the country has linked uh, the ID to the fast payment system, which is uh, called Prompt Pay and has had significant growth in the last few years, so going from about a billion transactions in um, 2018 to 15 billion in 2022. Uh, and what happened during COVID pandemic is in Thailand, they were able to essentially very quickly design this uh, cash transfer program to informal workers using an online uh, portal, um, using the ID for identity verification linked to prompt pay for the payment. And so ensuring the right person got the right uh, payment. So that's a very precise uh, example 
that many countries uh, are striving towards. Uh, and you know, we saw even in India when COVID, uh, within I think believe a days, um, um, millions of people were able to receive payments because of the DPI that was put in place. Is what? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, you know, I think the questions in the chat are great, and one of the reasons why I uh, love this panel is that we uh, these are probably my sparring partners, uh, partners with whom we really try to identify, you know, how to uh, address some of the adoption frictions. How do we get, you know, digital public infrastructure advantage uh, across many countries, global, north, south. And each of us obviously have our own mandates from our organizations. But you know, one point that I wanted to make was that when you have digital public goods, um, uh, you know, as components of digital public infrastructure, it is really easy to shorten the adoption curve, lower the cost, uh, and create a scale factor across many countries. Uh, and I'm thrilled uh, that, you know, we, uh, I think, will soon actually be hearing from the Digital Public Goods Alliance as well. Um, but really, I think that's one of the um, advantages of having reusable building blocks uh, within sort of digital public infrastructure implementation. Um, the second point, Madhuka, that I probably wanted to uh, make was that, you know, <clears throat> Nandan and Pramod in their uh, chit chat, uh, you know, scratch the surface of uh, the climate challenge. Uh, can we just spoke about it? And I think this is one of the most pressing challenges where we need to devote much more attention. Um, we all know that, you know, uh, there is so much data being generated in this space, um, uh, uh, but many in silos. We also know that 130 plus countries are reporting their nationally determined contributions. Uh, so a rich, uh, rich set of data from countries is, avail <clears throat> is available, but, you know, we're not seeing yet the globally connected ecosystem of data on climate targets, on progress, on emission reduction opportunities, which I believe will be key to unlock also that, you know, that couple trillion that <laughs> London mentioned to unlock the climate finance, uh, including through carbon credits. Um, and this is why, you know, I think uh, uh, the DPI advantage is just scratching the surface. More needs to be done, whether building the digital public goods components that go into various uh, DPI for climate. And we already had something where uh, a carbon registry that was developed as a digital public good with the UNFCCC, the World Bank's climate team, Norway and others and so on. Uh, already being implemented in a few countries to also then looking at, at the country level, there's environment ministry, you know, energy ministry, national resources ministry, and, you know, each of them have systems that are systems of part, not part of a common infrastructure. So I think working on these challenges from both sides is going to be, I think, uh, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, will help us then bring that DPI advantage. That's great. Uh, could I maybe put Vajanti in the spot. There's one question particularly on Togo and Nigeria, uh, Vajanti, and I'm, I know you've been engaged in both these countries quite closely. Is there something you can um, respond to that question? So I think both countries are in their journey uh, on DPI. Uh, clearly, um, many countries have elements of DPI uh, in place. And I think the movement we're seeing is how elements come together. And so in the case of Nigeria, we've been supporting uh, on the ID system. And um, obviously there's been a, a system in place, uh, an existing system in place, but the, the support is around uh, improving. And so whether it's uh, a new data protection law that has just been passed, there's already a, um, a data protection agency that's uh, been established even prior to the law. Uh, being passed, um, in improving the enrollment ecosystem um, so that more people can be enrolled and in, 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 in improvements in the system itself. But also when we, whenever we support, it's around the inclusion uh, agenda, not only the trust, but also inclusion agenda. So whether it's uh, looking at how to improve the 
group people uh, with disabilities, for example, or for those who are marginalized, people who are unable to have access to ID. So, so that's around improvements uh, in, in ID. I think the um, on the payment system, so with the social assistance program, uh, there's a large uh, cash transfer program called NASP, uh, and the country's been uh, innovating to think about moving from cash-based payments to digital payments. Uh, and um, during COVID, there was pilot where some of the payments were digitized, and now there's a full rollout nationally uh, of, of the program um, being digitized. So these are existing elements of what we call DPI, and I think the, the journey that countries like Nigeria on is how can we continue to improve upon these uh, and ensure that we think about it in a, in a broader sense so that when social assistance programs um, don't necessarily, or another health service program or others don't necessarily have to think about their own individual ID system or um, not leverage the broader payment system, but put in place those horizontal foundational building blocks that can then be leveraged across multiple different uh, programs. Same with Togo, the country uh, during COVID with the Novisi program uh, uh, put in place a system to be able to make payments quickly uh, using their um, uh, uh, voter uh, ID system. But one of the things that they recognize is if, if they had in place some of the foundational DPIs, um, it wouldn't have required having different elements and data sharing across different parts. It could have been done um, immediately. I mean, they did a phenomenal job, uh, but I think there was a recognition for if some of these DPIs, uh, foundational DPIs were in place, um, it could have been done uh, in days. And so those countries are still early in their uh, DPI journey, although they've made massive strides in elements of, of DPI. Yeah, um, again, tons of interesting questions in the chat, if anybody wants to respond. I wanted to maybe um, throw in a prompt myself. We have about sort of 10, 12 minutes left um, and be good to get some thoughts on this notion of, you know, Nandan said, how do we get, how do we get um, traction in more countries? Uh, he said 50 countries in five years. Um, and what could we be doing collectively to enable this um, so countries have choices, they have options, they have ideas that, that they can construct on and build rather than having a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, and in, in, in that light, um, as you are all interacting with countries, are there specific ideas or thoughts that you're picking up that would be good for all of us to consider here? No particular order here again. I'm happy to start again, but I actually, Kanwa, I loved your powers, power of two. So maybe we need a slogan for 50 and five of power of two. Um, <laughs> but I do think that we're at a moment in time, Nandan said that we're at a unique moment in time. And I think the India G20 presidency really helped put a spotlight on this agenda uh, that that help, is going to help accelerate this, this momentum even further. And there's no way that this agenda can be done um, by one country alone, one institution alone. And I think the network effects of a number of different partners who have been very committed to this agenda for a number of years, I think we're at a at a unique moment where we can just come together and accelerate this e even further. So I think that network effect of countries one of the most magical parts of the work we've been doing for the last few years is when countries visit one another and see the power of DPI in practice. So not a theoretical, but seeing it just the way Kanwal, whether it was several countries that um, uh, joined in visits to India, but also, so, you know, for example, Philippines and Morocco's visit to India helped catalyze their um, work. But then now what we're seeing is also Philippines and Ethiopia sharing experiences with one another, or uh, Morocco and West Africa sharing their experiences. And so the, the network um, effect of countries sharing with one another is, is quite amazing. But I think there's also the effect of a number of our ecosystem, within our ecosystem of partners um, supporting countries. And uh, everyone has a unique um, area and expertise that I think if we if we think about what each 
institution can bring to the table and how we uh, think about it as collective action. So that's why to me, um, whether it's the slogan of 50 and five or whether it's some power of two, I think the the ability for us to come together to to really um, uh, see see massive uh, massive movement and acceleration is is very exciting. Anyone else? And I would just like to, you know, yeah, Khan, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd just like to agree with uh, Vijanti vehemently. I think uh, the peer learning that we are seeing, um, these visceral experiences on the field, uh, she mentioned uh, Philippines and uh, Ethiopia learning from each other. And uh, in my experience, when we first started engaging with uh, these two countries, both are adopting MOSIP as their national ID. Uh, program. What was surprising was if you think about the diversity between Philippines and Ethiopia, one's in Africa, one's in Southeast Asia, when one like, is like 7,000 islands, one is like with this big landmass with like, you know, a very unique uh, context. Um, and yet in that diversity, there is a commonality of how a DPI is being rolled out. Um, I think that's that commonality is very important to keep in mind. The second thing I would mention is there, as we look at, uh, let's say, skepticism of the approach and say, okay, this is these are all the challenges that we see uh, down the horizon. This is why there could be challenges for TPIs not working in certain situations. Um, I think what we have to keep in mind is the impact mindset um, may lead you down paths that don't end up in impact anyway. And the development sector has seen enough of that. If we look at investments and start tallying up, okay, how many projects have been, have been funded in the last 50 years and did all of them achieve the intended outcome, what percentage would that be? And then the next level question is, if that percentage happens to be low, why is it low? Does DPI offer a better, better path out? And uh, this is something that uh, Pramod has talked often about an infrastructure mindset versus a solutioning mindset. While uh, And these two are very different skill sets. So I think in DPI, we have to take a deeper look on how do we make sure that the benefits that DPIs bring are equitable uh, and they are distributed across uh, population scales, because that's the unique advantage that a DPI brings to the table. And I think that is why I'm so excited about the whole DPI approach, because it starts off by saying that inclusion is its core uh, guiding principle. It is not going to be solutioning. It is going to be accelerating the ability of others to provide those solutions. And as we see more and more countries building DPI, that community is not is going to not only is it going to be a community of countries building DPI, it's going to be a community of countries having impact and building things on top of DPI. And we should put support that sharing as well. And, you know, as Kanwa says, there are concerns about inclusion. There are concerns about privacy. We have to think about those. But the way to, do, to uh, ensure that everyone is included, to ensure that there is integrity, to ensure that uh, there is privacy is to build things and to figure it out as we go and to deal with real threats and, and real problems and to, to uh, solve real problems. Um, Kizom, uh, I wanted to come in, but also maybe address the inclusion question that uh, Kevin brought up, which is something you're thinking about a lot, so. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, it's nice to go last um, and help you close this, Madhukar. I was gonna wear the same shirt that you're wearing. Uh, we wouldn't have matched. <laughs> um, Madhukar, I, you know, uh, Kadmal uh, talked about the development impacts, um, and I think at the UN, and I'm sure all our organizations, whether it's the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, everyone is thinking about, you know, are our institutions sort of ready to meet the next level of challenges that we are, uh, we, are we, we have been, you know, uh, set up to achieve. Uh, and that's certainly on our minds uh, at UNDP and within the broader UN system. Um, 
and and I would say, you know, our mental model, especially in the kind of uh, new investments in awareness making in digital teams, whether it's, you know, uh, our tech and voice office, whether it's the UN's digital transformation team and, and so on, is that our mental model is, you know, what are our anti goals? You know, we don't want DPI to be surveillance state tools. We don't want DPI to be expensive. We don't want DPI to not achieve uh, the sustainable development goals. And I think that mental model is also helping us work within the institutions of the UN, UNDP, to say this is where we need to challenge status quo, this is where we need to do better. Uh, but there are some extremely important and unique advantages of the UN neutrality, convening power, and so on, that we are trying to bring at scale to the table. And, and I would say this is, you know, uh, a, a really important uh, uh, part of how we are uh, transitioning as the UN multilateral organization. Uh, on safeguards, you know, I, I wish uh, um, uh, we also had the presence of our tech and voice office, uh, Amandeep uh, Sengil. Uh, we are looking at safeguards very carefully, very intensively. Uh, this is also a, a huge priority issue for our UN Secretary General, as he has identified in the policy brief that he released earlier in uh, earlier this year uh, in response to the priorities of the Global Digital Compact. Uh, so, you know, as we prepare for our the UN General Assembly and the SDG Summit, uh, we uh, hope to, you know, create the structure that will ensure universality uh, of uh, safeguards in digital public infrastructure. Uh, so with this, thank you, Madhukar. Thank you. Uh, I'll take two minutes to close this out, but any last comments, maybe a quick thought, anybody? All right. Um, so uh, this is fascinating and continues to engage all of our, you know, capabilities and thinking and everything uh, that we can bring to bear. The, um, you know, the task in some ways is just beginning because there's so much work to do and in some ways so little time because the, um, when countries uh, make decisions to set up, you know, some capabilities for themselves, um, they're in a hurry to do this. And the, the choice for countries is go with legacy systems, build out some system that, that can work in the short term because it's quick. If we can make this happen. It's proven out elsewhere. And bring, build, continue to build those silos that we've seen that we're building for, for, for many, many years. Or take a more strategic view and say, hey, look, we don't want to rebuild because it's too expensive. We don't want to rebuild because it, it doesn't offer the scale that we want, the exponential scale that we want, the, the power of true thinking that we want. Um, and so it's a choice. Um, so when we talk about whether it's or risks, right, we also are discussing DPI here. The, the alternative is, I, I don't think, you know, we, we can look at this in isolation. It's really... A, a, a public policy choice that governments have to make as to how do they want to build out the systems going forward. And to me, it's a no-brainer, right? There's a there's a smarter way of building it or there's a legacy way of building it that's costly and inefficient. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. Fantastic comments uh, on the chat as well.